I'm Jim Jackson. I'm a clinical psychologist at Vanderbilt, and um, I am in the division of pulmonary medicine. And I'm really happy to talk to you today about issues related to depression and anxiety in the context of chronic illness. Um, I did make some slides, but I think I'm going to actually just speak from the stump, uh, if you don't mind, as the previous speakers did. Uh, this isn't really an academic audience, if you will, and I think that feels a little more personal to me. So I may meander a little bit without the slides, but probably not too much. So um, bear with me. Again, I'm really happy that you're here, and, and I hope people have been warm and welcoming in Nashville in the way that they are. I hope you've had a Taylor Swift sighting or whatever people look for uh, when they come here. Um, so um, we're talking for the next 15 minutes or so about mental health challenges in the context of chronic illness, and um, there are many. And uh, the, the rates that people report range quite widely depending on the disease that people struggle from, struggle with. So um, often rates of depression in the context of chronic pulmonary diseases might be 15%, might be 20%. Depends a little bit on the population, but the take home point is if you're struggling with depression and anxiety, you're really not an outlier. The take home point, I think, is that's really an expected outcome. That's an expected outcome. And that's important because I think even in 2017, we certainly have evolved a great deal, but even in 2017, I think there is still a great deal of shame for many, a lot of guilt and a lot of reluctance to acknowledge, perhaps, that one is struggling with mental health issues. There's still a bit of a stigma. I don't know if you'd agree with that or not. It certainly has been reduced but I think people still struggle acknowledging that they do have problems with depression or anxiety. And uh, the problem with that, and this is really important, the problem with that is that the more people are reluctant to own that, obviously, the slower they are to act on that, right? And the slower they are to act on that, the less likely they are to get help, right? And the slower they are to act on it, the more the depression and anxiety take hold. And as with everything in the world, the more those problems take hold and become entrenched, the harder it becomes to unring the bell, right? The harder it becomes to engage those issues. So too often when I see patients, and, and, and this is true just generally, it's true across the board. I used to do a lot of marriage counseling back in the day, and so often I would see a couple, and by the time they really got in my office, the ink was almost dry on the divorce papers, right? And I often would think, oh my goodness, why did you wait? You know, why did you not come in earlier? We really could have fixed this. Could have fixed it, but you waited. And um, I think a much better model of psychotherapy that I would commend to you is not to wait until you're struggling, not to wait until you're drowning, as it were, when you receive a diagnosis, when you receive news, that is not good news, <clears throat> when you're starting to struggle, that's really the ideal time to come. I might even say, if you're managing well, that's the ideal time to come to see a psychologist. You can arrange a plan, you can get out in front of the problem as it were, that's a very, very different model than, hey, I'm drowning, throw me a lifeline, I'm going down for the third time. That's better than nothing, right? I really would commend that, but it's less good than, <coughs> excuse me, proactively seeking help for the mental health issues that invariably will come. It, it's also important because the more you let these mental health issues percolate, um, the more problems they cause, right? The more problems they cause across domains. So we know very well, for instance, that one of the consequences of anxiety and depression is less effective engagement in the workplace, right? We know that people who have significant problems with depression, including in the context of critical illness, uh, chronic illness. We know that they manage their care less well, right? We know that their self-management skills are less good. We know that their family dynamics are more challenging, right? So the longer you wait, the more these problems emerge, 
the more they emerge, the harder it is to get out in front of them. And the, in an ideal world, there wouldn't be any barriers. You just pick the phone up, go see a psychologist, it's all good, psychiatrist. Um, in, in truth, there are barriers. But trying to acknowledge what those are, talking about them, and engaging them um, is very important, um, particularly when you're aware of what the symptoms of anxiety or depression are. In a room this size, people are more or less familiar, they're more or less sophisticated with regard to what anxiety or depression is. Often the first time, with many patients that I interact with, often the first time they're aware of this is when a spouse or a son or a daughter, mother, father, whoever, says something's not quite right. You're, not, uh, you're really grumpy. You're really reactive. You don't seem to enjoy fill in the blank anymore. Um, and, <coughs> and I think when you hear that from people, you really dismiss that at your own peril, right? You dismiss it at your own peril. And yet we really do dismiss it. No, I'm okay. It's no big deal. And yet often that is the first thing that we hear that you may not be aware of it, but other people around you are. Um, I often say to patients, I understand that your wife might be wrong. Maybe you can dismiss what she has to say, but your wife and all seven of your kids and your pastor, right, and your neighbor and your, are, are they all wrong? I mean, is it really true that you're right? They're all wrong? I mean, surely not. So as you start to get feedback from other people around you, you really ignore it at your own peril. And again, these, these early symptoms, particularly as they relate to, de <coughs> to depression, which often emerge, um, they include subjective <coughs> feelings of sadness, they include irritability, they include low motivation, uh, they include <laughs> decreased interest in hobbies and activities, Often they include what we call somatic symptoms of depression, just a general fatigue above and beyond what your physical issues would explain, problems sleeping. If you have this constellation of issues, don't wait, right? To use the, the Nike phrase, just do it, right? Just talk to someone and uh, perhaps they'll tell you that there's no issue, perhaps they'll tell you that there is. It takes a lot of courage to do this, but it's important it's important partly because help is on the way, right? What we know is that psychotherapy isn't necessarily a quick fix for depression or anxiety, but it often can be substantially helpful, profoundly helpful. And uh, of course, I'm a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I have a little bit of a bias, but, um, but often regardless of what medication does, and medication for depression and anxiety is incredibly helpful. I think therapy is really invaluable because medication is doing what it does, but medication isn't, isn't attempting to engage the deep-seated issues that are emerging that you're facing, right, related to big existential questions, related to my identity, related to this is what I thought the trajectory of my life was going to be, but it's not turning out quite that way, right, related to Am I going to see my grandkids grow up related to how do my wife and I negotiate our relationship now that I'm really limited related to, man, I've struggled with guilt all my life and now my husband's taking care of me and, and that guilt that I had is really on steroids now. Right now I'm really guilty. So those are issues that aren't really dealt with via an antidepressant, right? Those are issues that are really dealt with and engaged via therapy and therapy can really help. So if there's nothing else that I convey to you today, it really is that, that counseling can be invaluable. Doesn't have to be 100 sessions, might only be one, but talking through these things is really important. Often talking to spouses, five minutes, thank you. Um, often talking to spouses or family members, it, it, it's great, it's valuable, but it's hard, right? It, it, if you have issues, this is, this is a truism, right? If you have issues in your marriage and then one of you develops a chronic illness, do you think you now have fewer issues or more issues? Thought about that? You have more, that's the math, right? You have more issues now, right? If you got along great before, probably gonna get along great. If you're struggling before, 
you're not going to get along great, right? I mean, the struggle, it, it, this enhances what is going on. So making sure that whatever social support you get in the context of your family is important, but also seeking professional help, very, very important. Um, I've got a few minutes left, and, and I'm glad to engage any questions people might have about depression or anxiety or the treatment of that, um, how you've managed that. Questions, comments? I just would like to know a good way to uh, find uh, a good health professional psychologist. You know, how do you sort that out if you're new into areas? Because I think that's one of the big things that slows people down is how do I find somebody who I think will be good? Right, yeah, I, I think it's a really great point. Often talking to your PCP or, or perhaps your, your pulmonologist, your subspecialist, I think is a good place to start asking, asking them if they know a mental health professional that they, that they can refer you to. I think that's a good place to start. Um, trying to find someone who would be licensed, um, whether that would be a licensed psychologist or a licensed social worker. Um, if you are um, trying to find someone in a given city, uh, this may be, uh, be careful what you ask for, but if you want to send me an email at Vanderbilt uh, and I happen to know anyone in your neck of the woods, I'd be glad to make a referral. But probably talking to your PCP is a good place to start. As a caregiver, yes. Um, if your patient is reluctant to the idea of talking to someone, can you give us some strategies to convince them that that would be a good idea because we brought it up and the response is, but I have you guys to talk to. And the thing is, I love you, Mom, I want to be your caregiver, but there's things that you need to talk to somebody else about. Yeah, sure. So how do we encourage that without being too pushy and right. making them feel like we don't want to hear their problems? Yeah, so great question. So in the scenario you mentioned, did you say that? You said that very thing, you need to talk to someone else, and that didn't work so well, didn't work so well. Um, one, one, I guess if it had, you wouldn't be asking the question, right? Um, so, so one thing to do, perhaps, is to suggest that you could go together and then frame it, uh, you know, this is probably somewhat honest, um, frame it in the context of, you know, I know you don't think you need it, but I think I do. You know, mom, mom can we go together? Maybe it's more my issue than yours, but please. Um, you both get in the counseling session together, it sorts itself out often. If, if your mom is the one who really needs to be the patient, a good psychologist will figure that out. But I think framing it that way is often effective. Yeah, you're welcome. Other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. And I find it difficult um, to figure out, like, sometimes I do believe that caregiver, they go through depression as well because you know you're taking care of some other person, but how as a patient can we improve that relationship in which like, you know, we do not, uh, you know, like we do not send our caregiver to depression. And is there like, I know there are medications, but is there any alternative ways? Can you sum, I, I didn't catch all of that, so. If they're, how is a patient, can yes. you help the caregiver if they're struggling with depression? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Um, I think that's a tall order for one thing, right? Right, to, to start with, right? Because you're managing all of your own issues, trying to help them. Um, so I, I know I sound a little like a Johnny One Note here because I'm gonna say the same thing again over and over, but I think encouraging that caregiver to, to talk to a mental health professional really important, really important. Um, or perhaps if they're reluctant to do that, to talk to their PCP about whether there might be a need for them to talk to a mental health professional, right? However you can get them across that barrier to entry. The other thing I would say quickly, and I know my time's up, but, but 
support groups, I think, are really important. And there aren't necessarily as many disease-specific support groups as you would like, but a support group that engages any chronic illness, I mean, any, any support group you can find that engages a progressive chronic illness is going to have some nuggets of wisdom, if you will, that are really applicable. We have a support group here at Vanderbilt, for instance. I lead it. It's for survivors of intensive care. But we have a number of people with uh, a range of pulmonary conditions who are not primarily ICU survivors. They come to that support group. The themes are the same, right? What's my new identity here? How can I, ch how can I engage the grief I'm feeling? How do I navigate with my family? I feel guilty that they're caring for me even though I'm not an old person yet. So very similar themes, they can be rich. Support groups are easy, they're inexpensive. I I'd encourage all of you to pursue those if they're available, they're good options, they seem to be effective. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.